this project I've been working on for the past couple of years comes out of a little bit out of my graduate studies work where I started in science fiction. And the third um, chapter of my dissertation is on H.G. Wells. Uh, I've been teaching science fiction for about 15 years. So um, I know a lot about science fiction, but it wasn't until I came here that I began to teach uh, African American film. I really had no formal training in African American film, but I went into it because our students kept asking me about African Americans in film, about African American directors, who was the first African American director, who was the first great African American actor, and I didn't have answers for those questions, and it was in coming up with answers for those questions that I eventually developed the African American African Americans in Film um, course that was just recently put onto the books permanently. It was just a special topics course. I'm teaching that course right now and it's a lot of fun to do. But the way that this paper came about is that those two things were separate. Those were you know, teaching and research. And then as I'm studying uh, in the normal course of studying um, science fiction film, I started noticing that some of these characters had traits of a racial stereotype that I had, that other um, scholars had done a lot of work on. And that racial stereotype is the Uncle Tom. Now, I had read, you know, a lot of the, the basic scholarship in order to teach African American film, but no one, for, from what I could see, was talking about the fact that there were these Uncle Toms in science fiction film. You know, that's weird. Why are there Uncle Toms in science fiction film? They don't seem to be, to belong there. And so in doing, in answering that question, the basic research question, why are there Uncle Tom's in science fiction film, that's how I came um, up with this paper, answering that basic question. For those of you who are interested in the study of racial stereotypes, you could do no better than to begin with the Jim Crow Museum um, at Ferris State University. Can you all see that or should I dim all this everything? State University. Can you see all that? So this is a really good, uh, a useful source. It has a wonderful uh, set of essays on various racial stereotypes, the brutal buck, the piccaninny, here's the tom, the sapphire, and it was Dr. Jones who turned this on, turned me on to this, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Years ago. And Lots of things you recognize, things that you don't recognize. Oh, who's that? <coughs> and there is a bibliography at the bottom. So that's a very useful source. For those of you who are interested in racial stereotypes in film, the best place to begin is um, Tom's, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammoths, and Bucks. Also, thanks to my friend Dr. Jones for turning me on to that. And I'll mention that. Um, a little bit later in the talk. All right, now I'm a film studies professor. Usually, whenever I do a presentation, I also do a visual analysis, which is to say I analyze how the images work so that you can see the relationship between form and content, which is to say that form is content. But there won't be time for that because in order to do that, I would have to explain those terms which are special to film studies and then show extended clips and then show how they're working. So I won't, I won't be doing that. For those of you who are interested in a shot analysis of this film, I have done several and I've done several scenes and I'd be glad to talk about that maybe in the question and answer period or if you would like to talk about that over lunch. All right. So since the mid-1980s, variations in the magical Negro stereotype have appeared in at least a dozen science fiction films. Enemy Mine, <coughs> which is uh, 1985 and the first uh, science fiction film that I can find that has a magical Negro in it. Batteries Not Included, 1987. Blade and its sequel starting in 1998. The Matrix and its sequel starting in 1999, going all the way up to 2003. The Time Machine, that's the 2002 version, Avatar, 2009, District 9, and The Book of Eli, 2010. 
And this racial stereotype, the magical Negro, continues this year, this very year, in other genres. For example, Johnny Depp's Tonto in The Lone Ranger, and Beyonce's uh, Queen Tara in Epic, which is a science fiction fantasy film for children, which I was watching with my children, and you know, I saw this character, oh, there's another one. <laughs> so what is this stereotype doing in science fiction film? I explain three reasons. In contrast to other genres, science fiction allows this character unique functions to remove or replace the type's dependence on Christian mythology, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, to replace the character's magical with technological prowess, and to physically transform the lead white character into the other, rather than reforming the, the uh, white character. Using Neil Blomkamp's District 9, the first, the first feature-length science fiction film made and set in South Africa, as an example, I also show how science fiction is well suited for satirizing the stereotype of the magical Negro. Remarkably, only District 9 of all the films that I have been studying over the past four years has used the irony and social criticism that are generic to science fiction film to deconstruct racial stereotypes. So, now I give a little overview of the magical Negro and scholarship and definitions of it. So the magical Negro is a reworking of the Uncle Tom and Mammy stereotypes in popular cinema that emerged in American films during the Civil Rights Movement and provided liberal filmmakers a tool to countering bad racial stereotypes and the racism behind them. The brutal buck, the silly and larcenous coon, the conflicted and treacherous tragic mulatto. The first films featuring magical Negroes were social dramas that took on racism and segregation directly. For example, Stanley Kramer's The Defiant Ones in 1958, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner in 1967, and Jod Gladstone's uh, Brother John in 1971. Now from, from this so short list, some of you might recognize that there is a similarity among them, another similarity, and they all star Sidney Poitier. <laughs> Too bad for Sidney. Because when film study scholars began looking at these films, they saw that Poitier's characters, while on the one hand having some uh, forward-leaning elements, <coughs> some liberal elements, also had some very conservative elements to them. And in Anthony Apaya's 1993 article, No Bad Nigger, which is a quote from Tom Sawyer, blacks as the ethical principle in the movies, and Donald Vogel's 1994 film history, Tom's, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks, analyzed the traits and functions of the Uncle Tom in Poitier's characters. Although these scholars did not use the term magical Negro, Apaya used the term saint, and Vogel just used the term Tom, they both discussed the magical thinking and synthetic structure of Noah Cullen, John Prentice, and John Cain. Apaya raised, but did not answer, these questions about the saint in reference to uh, <coughs> Poitier. Or does the saint draw on the tradition of the superior virtue of the oppressed? Is there, in fact, somewhere in the saint's background, a theodicy that draws on the Christian notion that suffering is ennobling? So that the black person who represents undeserved suffering in the American imagination can also, therefore, represent moral nobility. Does the saint exist to address the guilt of white audiences, afraid that black people are angry at them, wanting to be forgiven, seeking a black person who is not only admirable and lovable, but who loves white people back? <laughs> Later in this talk, a pious suggestion will inform my answer to the question, why are there magical Negroes in science fiction films? After a pious and Bogle, the magical Negro went practically unnoticed by scholars. But in 2001, Spike Lee began using Magical Negro in interviews and college talks. You know, Spike likes to talk. And Lee was concerned with the limited function of the characters he was seeing in films that, at the time, recent films at the time. Here's his quote. What really bothers me is this new phenomenon of the magical nigger that you see in films such as The Green Mile, 
the family land, the family man, the legend of Bagger Vance, and what dreams may come. These films all have these magical, mystical Negroes who show up at some sort of, as some sort of spirit or angel, but only to benefit the white characters. I mean, Michael Clark Duncan gave a good performance in The Green Mile, but when I saw that movie, I knew he was going to get an Academy Award nomination. The Academy just loves roles like that because it makes them feel so liberal. But if this character has such magical powers that he can touch Tom Hanks and cure him of his urinary tract infection, why can't he use those gifts to just walk out of prison? Of course, scholars continue to research race in popular media, including film in works like Robert Entman and Andrew Rajecki's uh, The Black Image in the White Mind, Media and Race in America, and Adelie Funama's uh, Black Space, Imagining Race in Science Fiction Film, which came out in 2008. But The Magical ne Negro was not addressed directly as a stereotype until 2009. You can't find him in Nama's Black Space, <coughs> with a pair of articles that began to define this stereotype in popular film. Matthew Huey wrote an article, Synthetic Racism, White Redemption, and Black Stereotypes in Magical Negro Films and Social Problems. So it took a sociologist to do this. And Cerise Glenn and Lander Cunningham, uh, the title of their article, The Power of Black Magic, the Magical Negro and White Salvation in Film, published in the Journal of Black Studies in 2009, November 2009. Glenn and Cunningham laid out a detailed and well-argued definition of the Magical Negro based on five characteristics. Uh, the Magical Negro is always using magic and spiritual gifts for the white character, assuming primarily service roles, exhibiting folk wisdom as opposed to intellectual cognition, Possessing a limited role outside of the um, guide role and displaying an inability to use his or her powers to help him or herself, which is the point that Spike made. Huey identifies 10 attributes uh, of the Magical Negro character in 26 films, and uh, some of these overlap with the others. First, Huey uh, argues that the magical Negro is uh, e economically distressed, culturally deficient, that is to say they're poor, culturally deficient, that they rely on folk wisdom, that they're capable of appearing and reappearing, that they possess primordial magic, that they have no social or economic mobility, that they serve to help uh, white, heterosexual romance, and that in the end, they support hegemonic whiteness and prefer spiritual detachment or spiritual reward to material reward. Now, only a few characters, like John Coffey in The Green Mile, and I can at least show you a picture of it, it's not a clip. There's the late uh, Michael Dunklin, Michael Duncan. Uh, only a few characters like John Coffey display all these traits. And so in his essay, Huey has these 26 films with the 10 criteria, and not all of them score uh, a perfect 10. Most of them are a 6 or a 7. I think uh, The Green Mile has 9. <laughs> Considering science fiction films with magical Negro characters, I can add these traits, and my research adds these traits. They're predominantly male with a few exceptions, like Zoe Saldana's Natiri in Avatar, or Gloria Foster's Oracle in The Matrix. These men, African American men, are large or otherwise physically imposing. They're, they don't possess you know, Spike Lee stature. <laughs> and they are coded as African American, or they are alien coded as African American. <coughs> And then the final thing is they're capable of enduring a great deal of physical distress, which is to say you can beat the snot out of them and they can take it. So these traits point to another function of the magical Negro to counter the, the buck stereotype depicted 
in black exploitation films and enacted in other popular entertainment like perhaps maybe gangster rap videos. All right, now, why am I using District 9? Because this film, like no other, shows how aliens are made. I think that one of the things that District 9 is trying to do is show how aliens, others, the other stereotypes are fabricated, the process for creating them. And the film is aware that when you're attacking a racial stereotype in a popular film, it's easy to replace one kind of racism with another. It's easy to replace a softer, gentler racism, to use a softer, gentler racism to, to replace what you think is a, a harsh, mean, violent racism. The other reason why I like District 9 for this topic is because it uses many narrative and visual conventions of Hollywood science fiction film but at the same time undermines those conventions with discontinuity editing and the exposure of the means of ideological production, which is media itself. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little synopsis of the film and then we'll go into the argument. So in distress, the synopsis of the film, in distress an alien ship comes to rest above Johannesburg, South Africa without fanfare. The South African authorities and its private contractors help the aliens by sequestering them in a refugee camp. Over the course of 28 years, the, alien multi the aliens multiply to 1.8 million, and the city's human residents want them removed. The main contractor in charge of alien affairs in the multinational United Company, MNU, has handled the aliens with violence and impunity experimenting on their bodies and struggling in vain to operate their advanced technologies, specifically their fantastic weaponry. Apparently bereft of their leadership, the drone-like aliens live in desperation, fear, and squalor. Vickis van der Merba, the bumbling son-in-law of a top MNU executive, directs the forced removal of the aliens from where they have been put temporarily to where no one can see them and put them out of sight further beyond uh, Johannesburg, but he is incapable of controlling the violence and chaos. He discovers the work of one alien accidentally, and this alien's name is Christopher Johnson. Beneath a shack, Christopher Johnson works to repair an alien shuttlecraft and begin the process of rescuing his people. The key is a dark, viscous liquid that Paul powers the alien technologies, and Christopher Johnson has been over the years collecting this precious dark fluid and putting it into a canister. Accidentally handling this canister of liquid, Vickis, the bumbling guy, sprays himself. Slowly, his body transforms into an alien body, which means MN, which MNU discovers and then plans to vivisect in order to unlock the secrets of the alien technology, which is to say that his father-in-law makes the decision to cut him up alive so they can harvest his body parts in order to work the alien technology. To stop the metamorphosis, Vickis forces Christopher Johnson, the alien, to help him and they take advantage of one another in order to achieve their goals. Their uneasy partnership leads to mutual understanding and respect and their fight against MNU and a gang of Nigerians, who really aren't Nigerians, uh, who occupy the refugee camp, Vickis places the needs of the aliens above his own. All right, so that's the synopsis. Now a little bit of background information. If most Americans watched the film, they would completely, they would just read it as a science fiction film with lots of things blowing up. They would miss what's going on in the film. So uh, based on his short film, Alive in Joburg, that he made in 2009, Neil Blomkamp's District 9 is the first feature-length science fiction film shot and set in South Africa, and for that matter, in all of Africa, as far as I know. Uh, Africa, African writers in general, and South African writers specifically, have produced very little science fiction prose from which filmmakers might readily draw. In science fiction in South Africa, 
Deirdre Byrne, professor of English at the University of South Africa, explains the lack of science fiction as a function of widespread illiteracy, quote, the restricted degree of knowledge about technology, poverty, and the crippling effects of HIV AIDS. The small size of African science fiction readership and District 9's Hollywood generic style raised questions about the film's audience. Who was Blancott making this for? And the lack of black characters in a film about apartheid and contemporary xenophobia. On the one hand, the film criticizes apartheid and its legacy through allegory, a, a strategy in the tradition of other South African films, which aren't science fiction, like Janny Totson's 1970, which, quote, uses a mental institution as an allegory of South African society under apartheid, according to South African film historian Martin Bota based on a futuristic South Africa in which Afrikaners have lost political power and live in despair, Jason Xenopoulos' Promised Land 2002 also seems to prefigure District 9 central themes, role reversal between alien and self, and emerging self-awareness for white South Africans about what apartheid means for black South Africans. Unlike other science fiction films exploring alien contact, District 9 exposes the technical and social processes which create these aliens. On the other hand, the epiphany of District 9's main character, Vickis uh, Van de Merba, appears to recycle a Hollywood trope when conventional narrative films confront issues of race. The bigoted and sometimes brutal white man is helped on a journey by an exceptional man of color. Or a Native American man, African American man, or in this case, a space alien man kind of thing. To realize the injustices of racism and the need for social reform. By becoming an alien, Vickis becomes more human, as more than one commentator has noted. But becoming an alien should bring the human into contact with other values, definitions, traditions, desires, and state of consciousness. Instead, Vickis only experiences the state of alienation not the other itself. There is no other on the other side of Christopher Johnson. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nope. So if Christopher Johnson's an alien, then there's some alien stuff about him. Alien values, alien culture, alien behavior, alien desires. We don't get any of that. He's just a screen. And so when Vickis uh, interacts with him, what he ends up getting are the liberal humanist values which are suspiciously American, uh, which is weird, right? Because the man making the film is a South African who grew up most of his life in South Africa, and then because of what happened with the fall of apartheid, moved to Canada. This is Neil Blomkamp, and was very critical of the earlier regime, and yet he seems to be recycling these uh, humanistic values. Now you're all with me, right? Uh, okay, that alienation appears to reform Vickis into the very thing which Western viewers had been trained to admire in films, the selfless hero, the romantic, the defender of children. The only space aliens with detailed characterization are Christopher Johnson and his son, and they exhibit some of these traits, and they add even more. Christopher Johnson has self-control. He's nonviolent. He's concerned about his community. And he's faithful. Uh oh, it's starting to look like Uncle Tom, right? So, from one perspective, Christopher Johnson looks like a ma magical, Africanized alien friend. District Nine's narrative is a com. All right, so now, District Nine's uh, overall narrative is a complex integration of three lines of action, and they're disparate times. One is real South African history coming from the past. So we have aspects of the apartheid past. Then the process of alienating and exploiting extraterrestrial population, that's the present, which is happening in the present of the movie and is an allegory for the alienation and exploitation of foreigners coming into South Africa. Y'all are not familiar with that background. I'll give you a little bit of that background in a little bit. And then finally, the metamorphosis of Vickis himself, which is the future. So Richard Pithouse, a lecturer at Rhodes uh, University's Department of Political and International Studies, 
sees the film confronting a utopic vision that some South Africans have of their own country. And here he's talking about these three, these three lines of action. Quote, by weaving past, present, and future into one cinematic vision, District 9 steps out of the all too easy distinction between an absolute break between bad apartheid and good democracy to look at how some processes of exclusion endure and mutate as we move from one political system to another, end quote. So most American critics, well, all the American critics that I can find, recognize some of the film's references to apartheid, but miss the contemporary context referring to the militar militarization of South African society, ever-deepening class divisions, punctuated by exclusive and often gated communities, the, influ the influx of documented and undocumented refugees, the rising and increasingly violent xenophobia in reaction to these refugees, and the exploitation of their cheap labor. So I'll just touch on a couple of things from the past. One is apartheid. I'm not going to go over that. You know, know a little bit about apartheid. And the film's title, District 9, refers to District 6, which was a resettlement policy. District 6 was, District 6 was an inner city residential area in Cape Town. It was declared whites only in 1966, and approximately 60,000 people were forced uh, to move to Cape Flats about 15 miles away. Subsequently, the government did not end up using that area, and it was not, people didn't begin to repopulate until apartheid came apart. Um, the film's also referring to beliefs in South Africa that the apartheid government used biological and chemical agents uh, against uh, native South Africans and against those South Africans who were <coughs> against apartheid. And there are references in the film to that. Um, for example, I'll give you an example here. Um, on June 12, 1998, just uh, about the time the film was being made, the British Broadcasting Corporation reported that the, quote, former head of military research laboratory, Dan Goosen, testified before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission concerning biological agents targeted at people of color. While the project was only contemplated, we quoted it received, quote, the backing of South Africa's then Surgeon General, who described it as, quote, the most important project in the country, end quote. Now, as for the future, the film refers to contemporary uh, efforts to control poor South Africans, and especially non-native South Africans coming from sub-Saharan Africa because they're political, economic <coughs> refugees, or because they're, they're just looking for work. So if you have the World Cup coming, um, and you're a prostitute living in Nigeria, well, you might find some work around the events happening. And so, the South African government did things in order to either export, capture and, and export of uh, these people, thousands, tens of thousands of people coming across the border, and to, um, to break up and destroy the, the um, shanty towns that they created. And many of these shanty towns would be created around major highways. So when a major highway would come into a city like into Columbia, Say you're looking at 20 going from here to Columbia. There'd be a shanty town just outside um, Florence, and there'd be a bigger shanty town just outside Columbia. And with the um, World Cup coming, the South African government, post-apartheid government, doesn't want people seeing that stuff. And so they began a process uh, almost 10 years before the World Cup was coming to remove those shanty towns. And it's called the N2, N2 is this the name of the, like, Highway 20, right? N2 is the highway. The N2 Gateway Housing Pilot Project. And they forced evictions of this informal housing from Joe Slovo, which is just outside of Joburg, Johannesburg, to Delft so that people couldn't see this stuff. And they used private security firms, which had grown up years before under apartheid, but still existed in the present in order to affect those forced removals. 
One of those is Wozani. Y'all haven't heard of Wozani? No. They're also known as the Ruagavar or the Red Ants. And they're called the Red Ants because they wear these red jumpsuits. They are still in existence today. They're still forcing removals of alien or native poor South Africans from informal housing, which means slums. And here they are dismantling. They go in, they dismantle, they take people's stuff. This is from the BBC. These are the roar of our here, right? These are uh, uh, city police. This is uh, an area after it's been gone through by the red ants. Here's a kid with what possessions were in the, in the shack, being ready to be picked up and put somewhere else in some other government housing. These are the red ants here. When you watch the film, you'll see the red ants. They're in the film. No one points out and says, oh, there's the red ants, but they're in the film. You, you can see them. All right. When the film was being made just outside of um, Johannesburg in Chihuelo, Soweto, which is south southeast of Johannesburg in 2008, the director had no idea that that place, Chihuelo, was on the list to be dismantled. And it was dismantled while he was filming there. When you watch the movie, it's not a set. It's really Chihuelo. It's a, it's a real slum. It's a real shanty town. And the carcasses, the dead things that are rotting, and the big cesspools, and that's all real. Wasn't planted. And when they were there, that's when uh, the red ants came in. And here's one image of Chihuelo after the destruction. See how they destroyed everything except for that building? This guy's getting a drink. That's how you get your drink. And that's where you go to the bathroom. And there's a picture of the shanty town before it was uh, destroyed. All right. So not only did Blomkamp know of this because he was a South African, it happened while they were, while they were filming. As I said, just in July of 2013, the Red Ants continued to, uh, continued to do their business and um, forced people out of the Cope Affordable Housing in Fordsham, Joburg. You can go read that online if you're interested. There's a BBC article about it. All right. So that's enough of the background. All right. So District 9 and the Magical Alien Friend, this is the argument that I'm going to present. Is the film using um, Christopher Johnson as a magical Negro, or is it trying to attack that racial stereotype? While District 9 deconstructs alterity, otherness, in order to criticize racism and xenophobia in South Africa, it humanizes the other to teach empathy and to explain the motivations of the principal alien, Christopher Johnson. The film may appear to replace one other alien as immigrant with another, the magical alien friend. Several characteristics of the stereotypical magical Negro emerge when Christopher Johnson's family interacts with the humans. On the one hand, the film strives to maintain the alien's inscrutability. But on the other hand, it needs a model for Vickis to imitate as, she, as he sheds his corrupt values. In part, this tension is explained by the director's attempt to make a political satire in a familiar science fiction package and to sell the film to an international audience. Blomkamp had reservations about the strategy and the construction of the alien family, but he went forward with it anyway. And here's his quote. Quote, I was kind of on the fence about it originally. You know, it's a strange film because you walk a fine line when it becomes too cutesy and too cliched and too popcorn and too Hollywood. End quote. But Blomkamp finally accepts the child alien as, quote, a great character because it really galvanizes Christopher Johnson and his need to get back to his planet, and it makes us empathize with him in a huge way, end quote. Ironically, then, the film appears to fill the empty alien shell with the humanistic traits typically packed into the magical Negro. So the problem is that in the film's logic, because the world, because the South African world that the film is depicting is so terrible, 
There's no human model into which Vickis could transform. He can't become some other good South African. There aren't any. And Christopher Johnson's departure is a function of Vickis' recognition that he should put himself above others. Quote, take your boy and go home. You have to make it. Don't make me go through all of this and not make it. You understand, end quote? The superior nature and capabilities of the aliens have all been suspended. They are completely dependent on the South Africans for their, dis for their existence. During the span of the film, the aliens are destitute, bereft of any social structure, and dispossessed of the fantastic powers which Christopher Johnson is struggling to reclaim, but which accidentally accrue to Vickis in the form of the black liquid that transforms him. Because what happens, okay, so Vickis starts to transform, and then guess what? He's part alien, and he can operate all those weapons which Christopher Johnson wasn't doing on his own. Thus, the typical science fiction prop serves a racial fantasy. Advanced technology reforms the soul. Although it is not his own goal, Christopher's function within the action is to shepherd Vickis through transformation, teaching the human values of a good family. At this point, the film slips into the buddy genre, which has created so many magical Negro characters, starting with Poitier's Noah Cullen. Um, the Defiant Ones is what supposedly started the Magical Negro uh, reboot of the Uncle Tom, and Noah Cullen uh, is, in, uh, is a buddy, Putty is a buddy with um, Tony Curtis's character. It's a buddy film. He refuses to leave Vickis, that is to say Christopher Johnson, even when he has no armor and the firefight is the most intense. He shows empathy at the death of his alien friend named Paul in the commentary and so much sorrow at the mutilated alien bodies in the medical lab that he forgets his own safety when the MNU guards fire at him. Like a Tom, Christopher Johnson works hard. He refrains from violence and empathizes with everyone. Christopher Johnson works hard for over 20 years, uh, and Vickis learns from him. In clashes with the Nigerian gangs and the various MNU forces, Vickis is the trigger man. But when Vickis kills his first human, Christopher asks, asks, I thought you said not to kill them. After this berserk and murderous rampage, Vickis refuses to participate in killing other bad South Africans, no matter how bad they are, including the most vile villain, Kubis, who is sadistic and enjoys killing aliens. And, all right. Vickis has learned to forego revenge, just as Christopher did when he saw the mutilated bodies of his fellow creatures. Before his moral reform, Vickis always looked out for himself and betrayed Christopher Johnson even as their friendship developed, offering Christopher to Kubis, this really bad guy, in exchange for his own freedom. But Christopher Johnson and the thought of his son break down Vickis' solipsism, and Vickis goes back to rescue Christopher Johnson. All right, now, that's the argument that Christopher Johnson is a magical Negro. Now, here's my uh, argument against that position. Um, and in the end, I don't think that he is a magical Negro. I think that the film is trying to attack it, to attack the production of such stereotypes. It's just that it begins to get itself into trouble when it's trying to humanize um, Vickis through Christopher Johnson. So, bear in mind, what I told you 25 minutes ago, the criteria for a magical Negro. So first of all, Christopher Johnson has no magical powers. He practices no religion. There's no voodoo in him. No space alien voodoo. And with that, there is no full wisdom that comes out of his space alien body. <coughs> that sounds, you know, hauntingly familiar to you. Uh, he can't give any wisdom to Vickis. Vickis must learn his lesson by becoming an alien. That's the only way Vickis is going to learn, by becoming an alien himself. And it's not, you know, to see the world from the alien point of view, because there is no alien point of view. There is only the process of making people into aliens. That's what the film is arguing. All right, 
he refuses to use his advanced technology to reform, to reverse Vickis' transformation. And when he leaves, it's going to take him three years to come back. And in that three years, Vickis will be an alien the entire time. And we have seen that in just a few days that that as he becomes an alien, there is less, he becomes human, more, more human, right? As he starts to, because he realizes what they've done to these aliens. But then there's less and less of him. And what's gonna happen after three years? Probably gonna be gone. All right, so which is to say, you know, he's not rescued, he's not reformed. All right. And Christopher Johnson does not prefer spiritual rewards to material ones. He wants a material solution to his people's suffering, which is to get in his ship, take the ship back, and get more aliens to come back and rescue the 1.8 million, which by that time will be, I don't know, 4 or 5 million. And when he does, and they learn that, they, that the South Africans have been doing experiments on his people, well, what do you think they're going to think about that? Will, will the aliens be as patient and kind and understanding as Christopher Johnson was when he sees the mutilated bodies of his people in the bottom of the MNU building. He was pretty pissed about that. What's that? I feel like the only reason he didn't display aggression or try to go crazy killing people is because he was pragmatic and he knew that the only way to... Well, at first he's just stunned. Well, yeah, he just wants to get out of there, and he knows that he can't stop it, so he's going to go, you know, the film's ambiguous about what's going to happen. Completely ambiguous. All right. So, a couple of things that I'll close with here. You'll notice that there is no Christian mythology. So, in some science fiction films that have magical Negroes in them, like The Matrix, or Avatar, or The Book of Eli, there's a Christian or quasi-Christian um, morality that provides the solution for the problem. But the problem with that is that instead of destroying the hierarchies that, that, uh, that drive, say, colonization, it just tries to reform them. So in Hollywood films, the magical Negro points to a greatest good, which, dem which demands sacrifice and service. And thus, servants are still a natural and necessary part of a balanced universe. And you can see that in Avatar. Uh, also, a Christian mythos supports a typical Hollywood Indian, uh, ending, which is teleological. That is to say that there's closure at the end of a Hollywood film. You get answers. There's satisfaction. There's revenge. The problem is solved. But that is not the case in District 9. The action just keeps going on. And the only closure there is, is the closure that MNU creates in its video, in its videos, uh, and its television presentations. But Vickis' world just keeps going. He just slowly becomes more and more alien, and Christopher Johnson flies off. Who knows what happens to him? Uh, no, in District 9, there are no moral principles. There are only those morals that we choose and enact at the time, and even those are weak. So Vickis' transformation, for example, transforms no one else. And what's even more disturbing is when you think about the aliens. So the magical Negro should be the special good person bringing the right kind of thinking or a better kind of thinking. But if you look at it and think about it long enough, you'll see that the alien vessel is actually a mining vessel. And that the aliens on it were mostly servants, servant class, who couldn't think for themselves. And they've got loads of these fantastic weapons that can fill all the rooms of this building. And just one of them can, you know, point it at you and you're suddenly push, water balloon. You follow me? So what the heck were the aliens doing with all, all those weapons on a mining ship three light years or whatever from home? You follow me? These aliens aren't so good. All right. They lack motivation and self-awareness, and their uh, culture appears to have been hierarchical and, ex and exploitive, just exactly like Joe Burbs. It's kind of a mirror, you get it? All right. So what's interesting is that the film uses magic and not technology. There's no magical thinking to solve problems. 
The only way to solve a problem is with weapons, cameras, <coughs> surgical instruments, not prayers and wisdom. So that what the film tries to get you to understand is that reality is created by the people with control of the means of production, with the control of the media, with the control of the weapons, with the control of the food and the water and the schools. All right. Finally, as I've pointed out a little bit before, um, Christopher Johnson is not transforming Vickis. Vickis is being transformed by an accident. And the only way that he's been able to um, understand how he has been wrong in the past is to adopt this alien body. And so in the magical Negro in science fiction film and other films reforms the white man. It doesn't transform the white man. 